Thank you very much. Is this working? Yeah? Okay, perfect. So, it was in April this year when the alarms of the hacker community, the digital rights organizations of the civil society and so were triggered. All those alarms were triggered because the European Union had registered a proposal to create a single secure European cyberspace. What that single secure European cyberspace was, we didn't know because that proposal was completely elaborated in secrecy, outside the public scrutiny. So, here we are today in this talk for trying to know which was exactly the meaning of that proposal. What did the European Union try to do with that proposal? When trying to understand that proposal, we will find some vulnerabilities in the power structures of the European Union and the global governance. So my aim here is to offer an insight, a proposal to exploit that vulnerability um, in order to, let's say, provide some kind of integrity of the cyberspace and to uh, ensure the respect for the human rights like freedom of expression and so privacy also in the cyberspace. Just before entering the issue, in order to help you understand my approach, I will say just a few words about me. Because, of course, I was fascinated in the middle 90s with the technologies, especially when I was uh, discovered, when I discovered that, that I was able to retrieve the passwords file of the central servers of my university just by playing. But then you know the power of technology. You have a perception of the technologic power. But even more important was the perception of the potentialities of technologies in the social level. So that's why I, in my free time, decided to collaborate with grassroots movements like ecologism, feminism and others in order to improve the performance of their work with the aim to um, have a better world in the sense of the same values that I shared with them. That was when collaborating with the Indy Media Network, I was one of the system administrators that were involved in the size of the servers made by the FBI. Apart from the personal experience, which was something strange, the important thing is that I became conscious about the political importance, the political impact of technologies. So that's why I entered the field of political science, first as a practitioner, working together with the European Parliament, then with the Commission, then taking responsibilities in, in, the, in the government of Galicia, which is the place where I come from. For those who don't know, Galicia is one of the three nations which are in the Kingdom of Spain, with Basque Country, Catalonia, and so. So now I'm in the political science. Now I'm not related anymore with any government. This is important to say. But I wanted to say this because, of course, I have a bias in my approach. And my bias comes from this experience. This is just for you to know. So, what was that single European, secure European cyberspace thing? What we know is that in April, the minutes of a meeting of a working group of the European Council, of the European Union, just a paragraph, were slash dotted, and then became to the public the proposal of creating a single secure European cyberspace in the European Union. And that was the first new we all have about that. 
Of course, the thing was rapidly to the mediatic agenda, and we still didn't know nothing about that, even when asking the political representatives, until an organization, the European Digital Rights, afforded to release a copy of the PowerPoint presentation used in that meeting. What that PowerPoint presentation showed was this. This is a map of the European Union. I'm sorry for the quality. That's the quality of the works of the European Council, it seems. <laughs> this is a map of the European Union where we can see a central database. database. Yes, and the function of that database is right in there. It is for storing the illegal contents on the whole, of the whole internet and to making them unavoidable to see. The idea is very similar to other projects. We saw the Nida Sachsen uh, White IT a project regarding pedophile contents which was very similar to this idea. So a central database and some um, collaboration agencies which were um, helping the internet service providers to block those pedophile contents. Sorry? Yes. Okay. Uh, we have there the prosecutors, the, uh, the courts, the law enforcement agencies and so. It is important to see, to talk about the similarities with the white IT thing, because they do not only share the model, they, on, they share also the issue. The reason why this proposal was being considered was the object to cut a pedophile contents of the internet. Of course, we can think that this pedophile thing is important. Yes, of course it is. Child abuse is a very serious thing. And there is a German organization here in this, concert, in this Congress talking about those issues very seriously, by the way. Uh, but it's very strange that a whole single secure cyberspace is constructed only to address that, that issue. But for the first time, thanks to the work of the European Digital Rights Organization, we were um, able to, to know that, yes, that was the case, because the pedophile contents were only the first step for making illegal content unavailable in general. And there was no definition, no formal definition in that proposition, in that presentation about what content is and what illegal content was. And that is all. Because more beyond, beyond the subject, uh, referring to the technical side, there was no information at all. The only information was that they will need to be the internet service providers, those who will be in charge of blocking the content, those that illicit contents. And that's all. That's all because after the proposal came into the public sphere, the proposal disappeared. The proposal uh, vanished completely. And that was a very strange thing, because in those days, I was working in an academic paper here in the Universität Konstanz, here in Deutschland, I mean, in Germany, um, trying to understand how the cyberspace notion, which is a notion which comes from the literature, from the fictional science romance, which is like poetry, if you want, is today in the official papers of the European Union. How that could be possible? My work was trying to understand how that was possible. So I, I found that from 1997, the cyberspace notion became to appear in the production of the European Union until in 2008, after the attacks, the cyber attacks over the Estonian network, um, it registered a boost in that appearance, which was easy to understand, because the states, the national states of the European Union and all over the world, uh, filled the threat. So, it was very natural for me to receive the proposal of a single secure European cyberspace, because it was the moment. What was not natural 
was to see how that proposal disappeared. So I made myself the question, why this single secure European cyberspace now has disappeared? So I, go, I went back to my research work and then I tried to find facts to understand what has happened with that. So yes, the Council of the European Union had registered that, that proposal with the frame of pedophilia, which is a frame of justice and home affairs area of the European Union, so courts, police and the like. Then the proposal came into the public as SEN and Oh, surprise, in the next development, the European Union changes completely the frame to justify the proposal. And instead of talking about the cyberspace as an unsafe place for our children, they began to talk explicitly about cyberspace as a war theater of operations, which is a major development and very strange and very, very dangerous. So I went even deeper in that research and I found that yes, some uh, a month uh, after that, we found the first joint meeting between the Justice and Home Affairs area of the European Union and the Common Security and Defence Policies of the European Union working together and agreeing on a protocol to address in a joint way the issue of cybercrime in cyberspace. And just one week after that, oh surprise, NATO adopts the cyber defence a policy based in the notion of cooperation, which was not only coherent with the joint work of the defence and inner security areas of the European Union and states, but it was also coherent with the needing of the industry to obtain a common framework to implement their technologies, their security technologies, because after the attacks on Estonia, the different national states began to develop their own cyber strategies, policies, national strategies of cyberspace. Among them, the United Kingdom, the United States and Germany. Those three countries, at least, have developed and published it. So this is official, this is real, this is not fictional science, this is not cyberpunk. Uh, this is official documents, uh, national strategies for that. But having different national strategies is very difficult for the um, industry of military security and surveillance system. It is better to have just one um, regulatory framework to implement those technologies. It's, it's cheaper that way. So the industry has called it the, the, the different um, states of the European Union to have only one policy, to work together. And that was done by the EOS uh, lobby of security and military technology of surveillance in the European Union, who wrote a document which is publicly available with that title, which, oh surprise again, whose content was nearly the same which was presented to the European Union. So what we have here is a near to 10 years policy making process intended to militarize the cyberspace. So what's the single secure European cyberspace thing? It is just the European step of that very big policy process. So that's what we have. So here we are. Now that we can understand what that single secure European cyberspace is, it is the moment to think about the importance of that notion of militarizing the cyberspace. Because that notion of militarizing the cyberspace to provide us security is the same thing like bombing cities in order to provide them peace or to instantiate a world to um, uh, make democracy to emerge. This is corrupted thinking. This is not um, a correct thing. <laughs> of course, this is a personal opinion. So, uh, 
Yes, what to do? It's political hacking. Here we are. So I'm trying to describe to you that vulnerability. So yes, we have this uh, process uh, where we have the national strategies, then we have the industry calling for a unified strategy, then we have the European Union obtaining that unifying strategy, and then we have the greatest military, by the way, the NATO is the national um, at North Atlantic uh, Treaty Organization, so the biggest military organization in the Western countries. I think it, that is our definition. So the NATO adopts that uh, coordinated approach for the Western country, but again, oh surprise, just one week after the NATO adopts this policy, here they come, the United States, and they enact, they publish a new cyber strategy with national level with very important, says this paragraph here, please I ask you to read this. This strategy allows the Department of Defense to organize, train and equip for cyberspace as we do it in air, land, maritime and space to support national security interests. So, in an official paper, we have the enactment of cyberspace as the fifth battlefield for this war. Very nice. Thank you very much for that contribution to the human thinking. So, um, the process of militarization, yes, what we can see here is that the uh, process of militarization creates tension in the national state level, because when the states need to delegate, to transfer their powers to the international level in order to make viable that militarization, they lose the power to operate in their own territories. So, it is a paradox because as long as the militarization goes forward, the states lose the power to implement that militarization, which is very strange and which is very interesting because at the end what we have here is something like a self-defensive loop in the cyberspace and that is not um, uh, an attribute of the militarization thing because when these people go to militarize Iraq or that kind of things. These things does not happen. This only happens in the cyberspace. So it will be really interesting to know how that cyber defensive, self-defensive loop works. Because in that case, if we know how that works, when new proposals like this came with danger to the cyberspace, then we will be able to activate that self-defense loop. That's the idea what I was working uh, on, and in order to know how that works, it is necessary to start from the nation, from the concept of the nation state. Nation states are the sovereignty, so the monopoly of the power over a territory by a nation. So a nation state is composed by two elements. The first one is the territory, the second one is the nation. Regarding the territory, this image is a very classic image of the Leviathan, so the representation of the state in the political science philosophy, okay, um, who represent this big man having the power, the justice, and probably this is the religion, so the truth, over the land, we can see the land here of his domain, with the houses and the properties of all the people. So this is the notion of the state. The people gives the power to that man in order to protect them from the dangers. And that is the state. So the state needs a territory. But what happens with cyberspace? Yes, we can understand cyberspace as a territory and even as a territory of power. But the cyberspace as a territory is a borderless territory. It has no frontiers. So, this is a contradiction with the very nature of the state, and that is the first element of the vulnerability. The second element of the vulnerability comes with the concept of no nation. What is a nation? I choose this one for obvious reasons, <laughs> uh, and we can say that in this uh, room there will be... Hi? Hello? The, in this room there will be um, a lot of Germans, and all them are Germans, but all are, them are different between them. So how the nations work with this uh, being the same thing and being different things? 
This works because nations are collective identities, and as collective identities are also the same thing as ontological networks. So all the Germans have different things, each one, but all us Germans share a core, a kernel of meaning, of ontological meaning, which is the concept of the nation. And as we can see, the notion of collective identity is networked, so this is the second thing. This could be compatible with the cyberspace. So these are the two elements. First, the territory, and second, the nation. Mm. Okay, so we have identified a weakness on the nation state. First, because the cyberspace is a borderless territory of power. So it is not possible for any state or for any alliance of states to establish a monopoly of power on the cyberspace, which is what they want to do with the militarization thing. And the second one is the identities thing. Uh, through the cyberspace, we can enact alternative identities for the national identities of the space. And we, ca we can have collective identities which are not linked to territories, so which are not national identities. But those which are the weakness of the nation stand, uh, state in regard with the cyberspace are as well the strengths of the cyberspace. So, now we have the mechanism of that self-defensive loop. As long as we strength, uh, as long as we empower the strengths of the cyberspace, we will be weakening the power of the states to danger the um, cyberspace. So, which is the vulnerability? Is this concept that I'm proposing here, which is the borderless collective identities, which are identities which are collective and which affect borderless places, okay? So, these are interesting because, yes, they problematize the action of the nation state, we have seen that, and they activate the cyberspace self-defensive loop. And I choose three examples of what can those borderless collective identities be. One could be the pirate party. We know that phenomenon, who have uh, representatives in the European Parliament, two or three, I don't know exactly, which have a lot of representatives here in the Abgeordnete House of Berlin, I think 15 or something like that, and they have a lot in, in, the, in the local elections and so. And that same concept, was not exported in the European and uh, German level. It, I was the other day talking with the representative of the Pirate Party in Catalonia, and they have acquired also representatives, and the meaning is the same. It is a collective identity, and it works without borders. So that's an example. Another example could be the anonymous thing. Yes? I don't have any much data, empirical data, to talk about that, but I think that you can understand the example. And the other one are cyborgs. Why cyborgs? So now we are in the last part of the talk. I think we are going well in time, yes? Because in political science, this question is very important. What to do? Vastun. Um, we have problems, social problems, political problems, problems of power, and we want to find a way to act uh, in regard with those problems. So finding the answer for that question is very important. But in the same way, it is very important to not make the same errors of the people who came before us, like this is the case. So, yes, uh, I want to address this question, but not in saying, hey, this is what you need to do. I want to address this question in a del deliberative way, because I think that this is the way for real democracies to work. So, I'm going to propose that notion, uh, the notion of borderless collective identities, but I'm proposing that notion under the frame of a cyborg, okay? Okay, if the European Union is talking about cyberspace, which was a cyberpunk thing, I have the right to talk about cyborgs here. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. Okay, but I would like to do that in a deliberative way. So, I will try to present this idea very briefly in order to allow time for you to ask questions, and not to ask questions, but to deliberate about this thing. So, very briefly. 
Why cyborgs? I'm not talking about robots. And I'm not talking about robots who are similar to human beings, which will be androids. I'm not talking about the classical notion of cyborg as a, a, a human being known, as an organism, uh, a mixture of organism and synthetic uh, things. And even, I'm not talking about human beings with amplified capacities, capabilities thanks to technology. And even, I'm not talking about any organism, not necessarily human beings, um, uh, with mixtures of technology. This is perhaps interesting, but those are individuals, those cyborgs. I'm not interested in this thing. I'm more interested in notions like this, which was made by Donna Haraway uh, in the 90s or in the 80s, I, I'm not very sure, probably in the, in the 90s. So she uh, is a she, uh, she um, and it's important to remark that she is a she because women tend to not be so present in the academics as they might be. So she has made this proposal about the cyborg as a metaphor as a metaphor of selves. So she told about cyborgs as identities. And that's the point where I can connect with this proposal, which is a postmodern proposal, post-constructivist proposal. But it is a proposal, at the same time, that works very well in this society where we live. So, focusing this as a dialectic process where we have the classical uh, cyborg which are that individual, which are a man, and who exercise the violence with, to make things. And we have the postmodern thing, uh, which was that proposed by Donna Haraway, which focus on the narrative of the societies. My proposal is a synthesis, where I'm talking about the deliberative cyborgs. So I'm talking about, with a notion of cyborgs, which are collective entities, so they are not individuals. It is not that you can construct in a garage. They are collective, so there is people involved, people very normal, like you and me. This is very important. Those cyborgs are networked, okay? So you can't touch them. It's not physical things. Yes, and what they do is to deliberate. So that's the notion of cyborgs which I'm proposing, which could be pictured like this. This could be a an image of a cyborg, a deliberative cyborg, in a given moment. But anyway, that's not a, a very good example. So I would like to present how cyborgs work. Cyborgs in action, because once you have the concept, you can review the history and how the, th the things happen, happen it in order to understand that. And I think we can understand the patents thing in cyborg terms. In order to do that, I'm using the results of a research of some German researchers, uh, Philipp Leifeld and uh, Sebastian Hounds, who have tried to understand, to, to understand why those hackers and communists and radicals and hippies were able to defeat the Software Patents Directive in the European Union when that patent was baked by very, very strong economic and political powers. So they try to understand why and how that happened, and they show us this evolution. In the upper side, we have what we can call the no software patents cyborg. So this is the different evolution of the people who were working against the software patents directive in the three times that they have analyzed it. And in the downside, we can see how the evolution of the people who were proposing that uh, directive was evolving. So we have similar uh, structures, so networked structures, and we have different evolutions. This is from the same research paper. This was, no, uh, yes, uh, yes, this is the same uh, paper. We can see now a different picture of those two cyborgs. Now, we have here the anti-software patents, and we have here the other one, and we can see how they are very differently constructed, even when they those are networked. And we see a lot more density in the 
uh, cyborg uh, of the no software patents directive. And this is another image of that cyborgs. Here we have the no software patents uh, cyborg, and here we have the yeah, pro software patents cyborg. And what we can see here is how those cyborgs are connected. Because I'm not proposing this to fight or to win or to that kind of war language. I'm talking about deliberation. So here is people who talk about having yes software patents. And here is people that say no, we don't want software patents. And the important thing is that they are connected. They evolve, but they are connected. And in this case, the connection was with the Europe, with the parliamentary groups, the politicians, the political groups in the European Parliament and also the Commission and so on, so, which is important in order to approach uh, what we need to do with ACTA, SOPA and so on. So let's learn for, uh, from our uh, experiences in the past. But what does the cyborgs do? What the cyborgs do is deliberate, deliberation. And deliberation is about narratives, the narratives of the patents. And here we can see the main elements of the patents narrative. We can see the frames which were disputed in those moments. The basic one which was the competitiveness, the other one which was the economic growth. And we see how those two cyborgs were trying to co-opt and to take the hegemony over those frames. And the red uh, cyborg here, which is the cyborg of the anti-software patents, was the one who afforded to obtain that hegemony of the narrative and the public discourse. Because they manage it, we manage it, probably you also manage it, to um, obtain a better narrative of that thing. So we have seen some cyborgs in action. And we know that <clears throat> what that single secure European cyberspace was. And we know that the cyberspace is being militarized. But what can uh, we do? I think there is a problem here. Why the cyberspace is being militarized? Well, there are some theories there around about the existence of some plutocracies, some invisible hands, something that makes that thing that things happen as they do. But it is usually said that those are conspiracy theories, things of dystopian narratives, nothing real, nothing serious, or yes. Well, just a few weeks ago, it was published a history, a history, a research, a research paper by the Zurich, ETH, ETH, and that kind of uh, a lot of universities, which were trying to understand how the financial crisis work, and they tried to see the importance of the corporate control in that in those events of the financial crisis, and here are the results. After analyzing more than one million transactions, after analyzing 600,000 corporations, they found that the 60% of the global uh, wealth was managed by only this small number of corporations and who they are. Fortunately, they have identified them. So we have empirical data of scientific research that backs the hypothesis of the existence of a plutocracy, so a government of a very few. And I think that we all know who these people are. And we need to think about how to deal with that. And yes, it is a crisis, but the word crisis, which in Greek means change, and here I'm, I'm showing you the Chinese word which is composed of two concepts, which is danger and opportunity, can be applied to this financial crisis. Because with the plutocracy thing, we have, we have seen the danger, and now we can see the opportunity. Because in order to neutralize the problems of the plutocracy as a form of government, which was um, yeah, treated by the Greeks from the times of Plato, we, we have the solution, yes, for the time of the Greeks. Thanks for the Greeks, by the way. 
which is democracy. So the way to improve the deliberation instantiated by the plutocracy cyborg is with as democracy cyborg. And this is my proposal. And my proposal also says that that democracy cyborg is not needed to enact. It exists. It is working. We can see that in the Arab Spring with people asking for democracy. We can see it in Portugal and Spain with the Spanish Revolution and the Indignados Movement. And they see we want democracy now. That's the main thing of these people. And we can see also this in the United States with the Occupy Movement and the 90% Movement because they are saying exactly the same thing. And these people is people like you and me. And these people are fighting for democracy and are fighting for against plutocracy and they want to avoid the problems of militarization of cyberspace in other fields just as you and me and this fight is the same fight of the other one this is a fight for democracy and this is also a fight for democracy it's all the same problem and what i'm trying to say here is that it will be nice to join the democracy cyborg which is working now in the same way that we sing um, empirical evidences of the plutocracy cyborg, I show here some photos and logos about the existence of a democracy cyborg. And it will be important because, well, that idea of militarizing the cyberspace to provide us security, which is the same thing as bombing for peace, it's wrong and about that wrong idea of bombing for peace, I do not have nothing more to say than what those girls say in this message. And that's all by my part. It would be nice if we can talk and deliberate about this. I think we have 15 minutes or something like that. Yes? So that's all for me. Thanks. <laughs> So, yeah, thank you very much for your talk. Uh, as usual, now we have possibility for a Q&A session. And uh, I have one mic here in the foreground, and there's another mic in the background. So we'll come to you if you have questions. Just raise your hand. And we have a qu first question here. Yeah, uh, thank you very much for your talk. I w it was a really great talk. Uh, I really like the cyborg uh, take on the on things. Yes. Uh, just, just a few uh, short remarks. Uh, first of all, uh, I think you said it already, but I think it needs to be said that uh, you, you said that cyberspace is borderless. I think there is a border between, you know, cyberspace and meat space. I, I don't want to call it, you know, uh, reality and virtual reality because, uh, because in, that, in that case we would be saying that, well, in virtual reality there might be no laws or whatever. But it's you know it's it's it is a border between meat space and cyberspace, right? And this border is uh, I think uh, is becoming a trench right now, right? Because all all nations are trying all to you know somehow uh, make cyberspace in their own image, right? And those borders are uh, are actually being enacted um, right now, I think. And uh, another thing I would like to say is that um, you said that. Um, Cyborgs, not in the uh, not not meaning that uh, you know somehow uh, people um, people's abilities are being amplified. I think it's a little bit not exactly like that because for the f some somebody said that I, I really like the thought that uh, computers for the first time computers are something that amplify the brain. We had a lot of tools that amplify any other organ we can think of, but computers are something that actually amplifies the brain. And maybe it's just, it's just something we should think about, right? It, and maybe use it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes, very interesting uh, remarks. Yes, um, indeed, I, I see this, the thing in a very similar um, way. And yes, I agree that with that idea of computers um, amplifying uh, the human being. But simply, I wanted to extend that notion to the network. So it is not just the computer, but the network. Anyway, I'm very aligned with your view. And referred to the separation between virtual and the other uh, level, yes, yes, I can see that uh, as well. But in the same way, I see, I might 
call here the, the, the conclusions of Poster uh, in his book about cyberspace, well, where he, uh, I, know, I don't know it's if, when it's a he or a she, but anyway, Poster says that um, yes, cyberspace uh, was created as um, an, an illusion, we have that definition of uh, a collective hallucination, yes, it, it is the definition of the cyberpunk literature, and then we have the political, first political movements in relation with cyberspace. So the independence manifesto of the cyberspace, it was Perry Barlow, I think, who, who wrote that. And in that political view, that first political view, it is possible to see how they say, hey, we, are, we do not have nothing to do with you, the real world. We are a different world, we are a different, I don't know, nation, I don't know if he uses that word, but anyway, we are a separate part. But at the end, the cyberspace relies on an infrastructure, which is the internet, and that infrastructure is owned by corporations. So there is a linkage in the property structure between the notion of a virtual cyberspace and the cyberspace, let's say, the real world. So that was a weakness in the proposals of the cyberpunk uh, way of thinking, in my uh, humble opinion. And that um, weakness was solved by the postmodernist people, because in the postmodernist way, they put the um, the, the point in the narratives, in the meanings. And they say that against the hegemonic narratives, let's say, of the neoliberalism, there is a way to solve that with fragmented narratives, which are the narratives of all of us as different individuals. And they propose that notion of cyberspace as a metaphor, as a metaphor, that's the way that, that Haraway does, and I think that postmodernist thing is a very interesting thing, even when the postmodernist literature is sometimes, you know, a little cyberpunk <laughs> in its best categorization. But I think they, they made a, a greater contribution. Hmm. I don't know if other people want to... Because yeah. I, don't, I don't want to be here the one who says the truth. I don't know if I'm explaining myself. He, he, told, he, told, he said very interesting things, so... <laughs> so, there's another question there in the middle row. Yeah, um, you started your talk um, saying that the EU has proposed a single secure European um, cyberspace mm. and... That, no, that, uh, uh, the EU registered the proposal. This yeah. is important. No. I'm sorry, I, I'm working just, in the political science, <laughs> this is very important. Just uh, because... Uh, when you look at documents in the council register, um, you see that uh, what was initially said to be a proposal by the presidency, such a registered proposal, has been corrected later on to say it was an expert presentation by, a, by one Hungarian expert. And so what you have shown as proposals on, on the slides are the PowerPoint slides of this expert. And in spring, um, members of the European Parliament have asked questions to the council how this would be followed up and the council has answered officially that there has no, had not been any follow-up to this. So there is, so there is not a, it's, it's not a surprise that the proposal has disappeared because it was just uh, um, an expert presenting it. And as, as a background, um, the ec one expert in the Hungarian representation in Brussels um, working on cybersecurity has been drafting the cyber uh, um, crime convention uh, in the Council of Europe. So there was a more or less personal interest uh, in these issues as far as I've learned. And so just to put this into perspective that this is not an EU proposal, uh, um, which doesn't say that there is, we don't have to pay attention to what's going on, but just to lower the, uh, the importance of this kind of uh, um, uh, proposal. And then um, you, d you redefine to the other part of your presentation, you redefine kind of what network analysis would call clusters just as cyborgs. Uh, uh, yeah, cyborgs. And I don't think this is really helpful as network analysis actually tries to clarify um, things, how network structures influence processes. And by just redefining one of the elements of network analysis as cyborgs, you're kind of blurring what science tries to, to make more clearly uh, you are making more blurry and I'm, I'm not really thinking that's really helpful. Mm -hmm. 
Thanks for your insight. Yes, you are in the in the right way when you talk that about data um, social network analysis. Um, first, I didn't talk that about that, but the work of uh, Hounds uh, does not talk about cyborgs at all. That's an innovation made, made by me upon that research work. And yes, it's the way that you are talking. They do the, that work in exactly the, the way that you said. And yes, there are some criticism about the social network analysis for those who tell that, no, this is only structures, that, that does not say any meaning. And well, but anyway, it was very, very interesting for me to find those research work because using the tools of the political science, it was possible to see and to understand how an alliance of um, resourceless groups was, were able to defeat the software patents in the European Parliament. Okay, next we have one question from Cyberspace from the IRC chat. Um, so, it, yes. So the question means, um, or the message I would say, thank you. I wonder what you think about the tools delivered by Jills Deloitte for analyzing these problems. I'm thinking of the smooth versus the striated space in which nomads built war machines for fighting the state. Okay, thanks. <laughs> thanks. Okay, and there was another question here in the front. Hello. So, um, you propose that uh, just by having uh, networks with more nodes and more connections, um, we can uh, win? Uh, I'm proposing to first delete that uh, war language of winning, losing, and binary logic, which does not work in the real world. So that's the first thing. I do not want to win nothing. I want to improve the quality of the liberation, because I think that's the fundamental uh, need for a real democracy. It is the liberation. So answering your question, it is not so much a matter of volume of increasing the number of nodes, of uh, having tighter connections, than a matter of addressing frames as a collective identity in a networked way. Um, and in order to obtain enough performance to, let's say, win, as you see, but in my language it will be to improve the result of the liberation, in order to obtain that result, what we need to do is to be able to address the main frames of the narrative involved in that struggle in a clever way that the people who share values which are antagonic to our values. So it is not a thing about good people and bad people. It is a thing of, of uh, if, our, uh, if our way of thinking, if our values uh, are, let's say, better than the values of the other, then they simply work. But not because they are just better. It's because we want uh, those values to go into the, into the public deliberation discourse. I don't know if I'm too abstract here. It's okay? Thanks. There is another question. So, yeah, here. there is another question from here. Do you think software is also a narrative? Sorry, if I think that software is? Do you think software is also a narrative? Analy analytic. Sorry. Software and narrative. Oh, very interesting thing. Mm, well, yes, yes, it will be my answer. I never think about that. I'm doing this in real time. Yes, because I have the idea that technologies are not neutral. I know that there is a lot of people probably here uh, uh, also that do not share that vision. But I think that technologies are not neutral. 
because technologies, under my opinion, are constructions of a given society in a given moment. So those societies have ideology, have values, and those technologies are constructions of those technologies. Just the example of Linux. We say, yes, we have Linux and we will make the revolution with this. I believed this in the past. But, yes, we have a networked system, we have a freedom system, yes, which has in, in its deepest place installed a hierarchical system. Because the file system of the Unix system, the extended thrust or any other one, any other one are hierarchical systems. So when I was playing with the anarchist people and we were using these liberation tools in the next politic a block, there is a very interesting reflection about that, about the liberation tools, I think. Um, uh, when I was playing with those people, we think that that technology will make us free, but technologies are not neutral. So, answering your question, as long as software is a technology, and as long as technologies um, do represent ideologies, then yes, software can be understood as narratives. But that's my view about that. And it will be interesting having more views about that question, which is really interesting. Okay, we have another question here. Thank you. Oh, do I not get to hold it? Okay. Um, can I just hold it? Is that about um, sorry about that. Yeah. So thank you very much. That was a very beautiful lecture. Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask, though, is that, have you considered the risk of um, following legislators into this strange narrative about cyberspace by construing their opponents as cyborgs might distract away from rights uh, being taken away from them in the real world, like the right to a freedom of association or privacy, um, if they construe themselves as sort of cyborgs? So, if I have considered, please, the risks of following the legislators in what, exactly? Uh, into this narrative about cyberspace. So, they talk about cyberspace, so you say, then we should construe the opposition to that as, um, when they talk about militarizing cyberspace, you say, well, we construe the opposition to that as becoming cyborgs and network cyborgs to, to fight that. But I was just worried that if you think the protesters sort of having rights in that space, would they then forget about their rights in the real world, like privacy and freedom of association. Is that clear? I don't really have an answer for that, sorry. Um, don't have, I, don't, I, can't, I can't identify the references for provide you a, an answer, sorry. Perhaps do you have an insight about that? No. Well, no? Yeah, no, I guess my insight was that it might risk that people yeah. worry about their um, privacy in, in the real world or of their right to freedom of association in the real world, which are coming under threat under sort of laws pertaining to be about cyberspace, which mm -hmm. I think is what you were talking about a little bit yeah. in your lecture. Mm -hmm. um, and then I just worried that encouraging people to think of themselves when they protest against that as cyborgs might f sort of force them, you know, not force them, but encourage, them. I, I don't know, maybe I'm not making any sense, but that's kind of, does anyone get what I'm talking about? <laughs> okay, okay. Thanks, thanks. More questions? Yeah, are there any other questions from the public? Okay, it doesn't look like it, so uh, let me thank you again and let's have another round of warm applause for our speaker. <laughs>